Good morning, everyone. We're delighted uh, to be together today, and we especially welcome N.T. Wright. Dr. Wright is a world-renowned scholar, retired bishop of the Church of England. Until 2019, he was research professor of New Testament and early Christianity at St. Mary's College at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, he is currently the Senior Research Fellow at Wycliffe Hall at Oxford University. And as most of us have come to know him, he is the author of over 80 books. My uh, gateway drug was 1991's The Climax of the Covenant, and I've been hooked since then. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us, Tom. I trust that you and Maggie have done well the last couple months that you've been able to hunker in place. Yeah, thank you. And it's very good to be with you all and uh, happy memories of working with you on previous things at Pepperdine and elsewhere. Um, yes, it's not been entirely easy the last few months because uh, being locked down as we officially are, and particularly for the, for the first bits of it, we really weren't supposed to leave the house except for very quick forays to go and get some milk or bread. So we were ordering in groceries. We were fortunate in that the college across the street allowed us to go for walks in their garden because the, we have a tiny garden here which uh, takes about one minute to walk around, but the college garden takes about 20 minutes to walk around. So we haven't been entirely without fresh air and exercise, but it is very strange, and particularly not being able to see the family. Um, the, the, to begin with, both our grandchildren who live close to us had birthdays, and all they could do was to come and park up the other side of the street and open the car windows. And we stood in the front doorway and sang happy birthday across the street at them, much to the amusement of the neighbors. Um, but stuff like that is kind of quirky and fun in a way, but it's also very sad. And, and we, we're still working our way out of that sad time where we're allowed now just to see them and go and sit out in the garden with them, but not actually to hug them and so on. So it's, it's actually emotionally quite a roller coaster. I think, we, I think we've done all right, though we'll sure be glad when it's over. <laughs> well, you said you're going for fish and chips with the grandkids today. That's... Yeah, and th that, that, will be, that will be out of doors in the garden, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad for that. And you've mentioned to me that you've been doing some cycling. Yes, um, uh, because I'm back in Oxford for the first time for 30 years, I'm riding a bike. Oxford's a wonderful city to cycle around. And Oxford has been empty, no students, no tourists. It, it's weird right through the spring and now the summer and uh, just a f started to fill up a little bit more now but so I, I do my shopping on the bike I can go up to Wycliffe Hall where I uh, have an office as well and sneak in there we're not actually meeting there but I can go and check mail and so on and Oxford is a wonderful city just to cycle around for half an hour and get some exercise so I'm ab able to do that um, without meeting anybody so I don't even need to wear a mask. Well, again, thank you for joining us, and uh, you've been a great theological guide to this group. We're ministers in Churches of Christ for the most part. And um, one of the reasons I think we felt so attached to your writings in the beginning is your high ecclesiology. We come from a tradition where the church does matter. And so your writings put the church right at the center of the work of God, that we participate with God and his, his movement toward new creation. And you have written that the church is a small working model of God's new creation. So I wondered if in light of all of the social unrest, the exposure of systemic racism once again in the United States, if you could say a word to us about how important ecclesiology is. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And it's interesting, I don't think when I wrote The Climax of the Covenant, I don't think I realized just how much I was doing exactly what you just described and bringing the church back into the middle of Pauline theology, because so much Pauline theology has been done by Protestants who are reacting against the church with a capital C for church, whether it's the Catholic church or other mainstream churches and, and saying, no, we're Protestants. We believe in justification by faith, so it's my faith that matters, and I don't need the church for that. And of course, when you do that, you pull Paul apart, because whether it's Galatians or Romans or Ephesians or wherever, uh, every letter he writes is about unity in some way or another. 
I mean, he expounds justification specifically in Romans and Galatians and hints elsewhere, but every letter is about the unity of the church. Romans 14 and 15 stresses that because of the faith which we have, we now have koinonia, fellowship, with all the others who have that same basic faith. And you can see in Romans, it's a very delicate situation because different house churches in Rome are following different customs about keeping holy days or not, about eating kosher food only or not. And Paul is saying, look, we've got to transcend these things which basically reflect our ethnic origins. And we've got to find a way of, with one heart and voice, glorifying the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. And I don't know if it was with you, Mike, or with somebody, but um, many times when I was talking about my book, Paul and the Faithfulness of God, when it came out seven years ago, people would say, Tom, if Paul could come back today, what would he be most surprised by or shocked by in today's church? And I would say unhesitatingly, not just that we are disunited, but that we don't care. That it doesn't seem to matter. We have different denominations. I know the churches of Christ don't use that, uh, the D word, but uh, that, that's, how, that's how it is perceived. And of course, um, around the world, oh, it's this church, that church, the other church. And we've kind of colluded with that. And we've had attempts in the last century to have the ecumenical movement, but it's got tangled up in various arcane theological problems, often reflecting the sociological fact that we really don't want to get together with that lot down the road because they're a bit different from us. Um, and in Britain, you know, the Anglican versus Roman Catholic thing is often Britain versus Ireland. And you get these different spins and nobody actually names that. It's just, oh, well, they're a bit different. We like them, they're nice people, but we don't worship with them. Well, we, it's time we actually gave up that and said, we've got to get together. And that's got to be done locally from the ground up and also from the church leadership. It's got to come at all levels. But then the, the business about the church being a small, small working model, this comes to me from particularly the biblical theology of temple. The temple and the tabernacle before it in Exodus 40 and then the temple in 1 Kings 8, the temple is a small working model of God's new creation. The creation is in danger of falling apart because of the fall in Genesis 3. But then as you work through the Pentateuch, the establishment of the tabernacle and God coming to dwell there in person is a sign of what God intends to do in the end, to bring heaven and earth together and come and dwell there with people. And then the temple is supposed to be that in Jerusalem. And then in Jesus' day, people went to Jerusalem because the temple was where heaven and earth met. And yet something odd is happening that Jesus himself in John's gospel is claiming to be the new temple in some sense. He speaks of the temple of his body, says John in chapter two. So then when we have all that temple theology in our heads, and then we come to Ephesians, we find in Ephesians 1 verse 10, Paul saying that God's intention from the beginning was to sum up in Christ everything in heaven and on earth. And this is so counterintuitive in Western Catholicism or Protestantism now. We think that the aim is to get humans or human souls or whatever from earth to heaven. But that's never what the Bible is saying. The Bible is talking about God's eventual plan to bring everything together, heaven and earth together in Christ. And that's Ephesians 1. And then in Ephesians 2, we see what that looks like now. And I've often said it like this for justification. God aims to put everything right at the last. That's his ultimate goal. In the present time, he puts human beings right by grace through faith so that they can be part of his putting right project for the world. This is how justification and justice belong together. And in Ephesians 2, what it looks like is this. Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, a passage much beloved of Protestants, evangelicals, whatever, is that we're all sinners and we are saved by grace through faith. Wonderful. Hallelujah. Yes. And then people often stop at verse 10, but verse 11 goes on. The necessary result of that, and if you don't see this as the necessary result, you haven't understood justification itself. The necessary result is that Gentiles and Jews now belong in the same family, because what kept the Gentiles out of the people of God was their idolatry and the behavior which resulted from that. 
but in Christ Jesus, Paul says, the dividing wall has been broken down because in Christ, God has dealt with the idols that have usurped his rule over the world. God has defeated the idols, and therefore anyone from the idolatrous, sinful Gentile background who becomes part of the Messiah family, part of the family of God in Christ, is a sinner no longer. And to imagine that they are still sinners and idolaters is to disbelieve in the power of the cross. And so Paul then says, retrieving that whole temple theme, that now you are no longer aliens and exiles, but fellow citizens, members of the same family. And what's more, we are built together into a house, which is the new temple, which is the dwelling of God by the Spirit. See, the biblical theology is not how to get humans to heaven. It's how to get the God of heaven to do what he always wants to do, which is to come and live with humans. Revelation 21 says, the, the, the New Jerusalem, the dwelling of God is with humans. And so in Christ, God has come and dwelt with us. And now by the Spirit, God comes to dwell with us and in us, precisely as we are one body in Christ. Now, here's the thing. The church seems to me to have forgotten that really for the last several hundred years so that then when the awful signs of hideous abominable racism have come up in britain and in america and in many other parts of the world over many centuries now the church has been de-skilled from dealing with it. The church should have been the community which demonstrated to the world, look, this is how it's done. This is how you can get a multicultural polyglot, polychrome society, all one in Christ Jesus. And the world would have been amazed. Instead of that, the church has divided into its different subgroups, its different ethnicities, its different skin pigment, pigmentations, language groups, whatever, without any imperative of getting back together. And so then when people have tried to do multiculturalism or polychrome society, often it hasn't worked. They've been trying to get the results of the gospel without paying attention to the gospel itself and the God of the gospel. So as a result, when the church now says, oh dear, we seem to have been racist all this time, it isn't just that we in the church have failed to obey some new secular imperative that the secular world has just discovered thou shalt not be racist. It's that we should have been modeling all along what God's intention for humanity as a whole always was. Of course, it's difficult. That's why you need the gospel of the cross and the power of the spirit in order to make it even thinkable. But we in the church should have been thinking it and should have been doing it all these years. And if we had, then all sorts of other wickednesses might well not have happened or not in the same way. And we would have been able to critique them from a position of wisdom rather than now playing catch up from a position of shame. So, sorry, that's a very long answer. But no, thank you so much. And, uh, we've turned to you again and again for theological underpinnings <laughs> for things. And in, at this important time of addressing this social unrest and the exposure of systemic racism, to have that anchored in this high theology and our calling in God is very important. Well, Tom, I asked if, especially today, right. you could say a word to us about your new book, God in the Pandemic, these ministers have been working hard over time the last several months trying to keep their churches connected. But in the midst of it, they've had a lot of experts uh, try to explain exactly why it's there. There's an old saying that in every church, there's somebody who knows why we have the, uh, the pandemic. Don't let them teach on it. <laughs> but I, uh, I think you've addressed that in your book, and you've talked about how there is great mystery, but what really matters is that we come into this with the proper vision of God, as yeah. we have learned about him in the biblical story. Can you speak yeah, to that, yeah. please? Well, yes, it's, it's remarkable. I, I suppose what I've done in this little book, this is, this is the, the, the British version. I know the American version looks slightly different, but it's, it's the same book. Um, I was struck when the thing first began by word coming from friends in Britain and also in America of some people saying, oh, this is a sign of the end times. It means that the rapture is about to happen, whatever. And I, I 
suspect that you and the Churches of Christ um, have all read Surprised by Hope and you're not going to be taken down that line, but still then, could it be a sign of the end? And I really wanted to say to that, no, absolutely not. Jesus in Mark 13 says you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes, but the end is not yet because when the end comes, when the second coming comes, it will be like a thief in the night. There won't be great horrible things going on to make you think, oh, it must be now. That the whole point is it will be, be when you don't expect. But then other people were saying, and I got lots of quite sharp feedback on this, people saying, haven't you read the prophet Amos? Don't you know that when this sort of thing happens, it's because God is angry and he's punishing you and in order to force you to repent. And I thought, well, hang on. I know the ancient pagan world and the ancient Jewish world quite well. And it's in the ancient pagan world that whenever something bad happens, a plague or a bad war, an earthquake or something, immediately people say the gods must be angry. And so they go off to the pagan priests and priestesses who do funny little sacrifices and they inspect animal entrails. And they, ah, it's because we didn't keep that festival last October. We didn't say the prayers right. So we have to offer special sacrifice. That's how pagans think. Now, of course, within the Old Testament, there is a one strand, not the only strand in the Old Testament, there is one strand which runs from Deuteronomy to Daniel, which says, here is the covenant with Israel. And if Israel basically dishonors or disobeys the commands, then the covenant will work backwards, as it were. And instead of blessing, there will be curse and the ultimate curse will be exile. And the prophets like Amos and like Isaiah 1 to 12 and so on, they draw on that. They say, you've been disobedient, therefore these bad things have happened to you, so you need to repent. And classically, the book of Lamentations is a lament, but also a repenting lament. And the book of Daniel includes that amazing prayer in Daniel 9, where Daniel says, yep, you said, here's the covenant, if you break it, you'll go into exile. Well, we did, and you did, and here we are, and now please can we go home again? And it plays out from there. So that is one entire biblical strand, that's all there. But in parallel with that strand, we have the book of Job. And it's Job's comforters who say, oh, you're in trouble because you've sinned, or you may be hiding it, but actually, Job, you've been a very bad lad, and, and no wonder these things happen to you. And, and the whole structure of the book, and then the answer of God at the end, screams, no, that's not the case. And Job knows it's not the case as well. And along with that, we have Psalm 44, the great psalm which St. Paul then draws on in Romans 8 when he is talking about lamenting at the heart of the world's pain and God the heart searcher knowing what the spirit is doing within us and the spirit is interceding within us with groanings that cannot be uttered and so it goes from Psalm 44 in the book of Job and Psalm 73 and Psalm 22 those great psalms of lament and I see these as two great Old Testament strands and to me the fascinating thing I don't think I really fully draw this out in the book but I now see it on the one hand you have the the, the covenantal strand which says if you break the covenant, then the curse will come upon you. Well, Jesus stands in the middle of that strand. Galatians 3 verse 13, he became a curse for us. He bore the curse of exile on our behalf. But there is the other strand, which is about the innocent sufferer, the Jobs, the Psalm 44 people who say, hey, all this is happening to us, but we haven't gone wrong. We haven't worshipped idols. So why is it happening? And those Psalms of lament also come true in Jesus. And he quotes Psalms 42 and 43 in John 12, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, and in Gethsemane as well, now is my soul troubled. And then Psalm 22 on the cross, my God, why did you abandon me? So we need to recover a sense of how the biblical narrative works. And it all comes together in Jesus, who is simultaneously the last great prophet warning Israel that if she doesn't repent now, then Jerusalem is going to fall. And from that point of view, he's standing in the Deuteronomy tradition. But at the same time, he is launching an entirely new project, which we can loosely call new creation, so that when the disciples say about the man born blind, who, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus says, no, it was neither him nor his parents. It was so that the new thing that God wants to do can be manifested in him. And suddenly we have a sense of a new world opening up 
in which it won't make sense to say, oh, something bad's happened, therefore God is cross with you. No, God is now in the business of healing and restoration. Of course, it is perfectly possible for God in my life, in your life, in the church's life, in the world's life, to do things which shout at us, hey, you're going in the wrong direction. But that's not what we should expect as Christians. We should expect something like what you find in Acts 11, and I do draw this out in the book, that when, they, when there is the famine in uh, which the prophet Agabus says is going to strike the whole Middle East, um, the church in Antioch does not say, oh, it's a sign that the Lord is coming back, or nor do they say, oh dear, it's because we've been sinful and God is punishing us and calling us to repent. They simply say, who is going to be at risk here? What can we do to help? And who shall we send? And was that being practical and political rather than theological? No, that was the spirit-led response. That was the new creational response. Yes, something bad is happening, but in the presence of God and in the power of the Spirit, we can go and help. And the church has done it ever since. I draw out in the book how in the second and third and fourth centuries, when there were epidemics, the Christians would stay and nurse people while the doctors all ran away. And the Christians would sometimes die as a result. And they would explain, we follow the man who died for us. So the least we can do is to put our lives on the line to help anyone and everyone who needs us. But for me, and you asked about the question of how God runs the world. What does it mean to say God is in control of the world? One of the really frustrating things I've had over many years is that many Christians read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John without realizing that the whole of the gospel tradition is about what it means to say that God is becoming king. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. And what it means is that God does not come and say, okay, I'm just going to sweep all the evil out of the way and set up a totally different kingdom. It means that through Jesus and through his followers in the power of the Spirit, God is doing and being what the humankind need him to do and be. So that in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit and the meek and the peacemakers and the mourners and the hungry for justice people, because it's through those people that God's sovereignty is exercised in the world. And what we have in the New Testament is the redefinition of what sovereignty itself looks like and the cross of Jesus Christ and the tears of Jesus at the tomb of his friend. They are at the heart of that vision. And I suspect that we in Western Christianity have still got a long way to go to get to base number one in terms of figuring out what it means that when God came to save the world, he came as a crucified Messiah. That's there all the way through. And for me, writing about the pandemic has been a way of showing how the whole biblical revelation funnels down onto that point. And that's where I think we need to be standing. Thank you so much, Tom. I have a follow-up question I wanted to mention to you. <laughs> chat room is active right now. Uh, one comment was, can we do this every week? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid you're a bit busy for that. We, we'll take the yeah, one time. This, but I also love somebody saying that's the first library I've seen where I honestly believe every book has been read. And uh, so we, we appreciate <laughs> possibly, that. Possibly. I, I do want to follow up uh, because at the end of the book, you come back again, just as you were speaking about to the importance of lament. Uh, our churches yeah. sometimes are uncomfortable with that. Sometimes you get the reaction, I'm already sad. I don't need more mm -hmm. lament. But could you mm -hmm. speak to the importance of lament mm -hmm. at this time? Yeah. I mean, those psalms of lament are there for a reason. And there's no way in which we could say, oh, well, back in the Old Testament, of course, they didn't know Jesus, so they were bound to lament. No, Jesus himself laments. As I said, uh, Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus is a very profound moment. And in John 20, and I think I say this in the book, John 20 is one of the most spectacular chapters in the Bible. Here is new creation beginning. But the way we see new creation is through the tears of Mary, through the locked in disciples in the upper room, and through the doubts of Thomas. And that's very profound. The tears, the locked room, and the doubts. Is that not where so much of the world has been recently? And the great news is that that's where Jesus comes and reveals himself. Here I am. It's me. Behold, my, my hands and my side. And Thomas, yeah, sure, go ahead, touch and see. It really is me. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And, and this, this image of 
how it all then plays out through that lament is very profound, and particularly in that passage I mentioned in Romans 8, that uh, it's so easy to think the world's in a mess, but we in the church, we ought to be all right. Uh, the answer is no. The church is called to be the people who are in prayer at the place where the world is in pain. That is central to the church's vocation. It's part of the church's glorification. Isn't that strange? We think of glorification as going to heaven or shining like an electric light bulb, but no. Glory means what it means in Psalm 8, which Paul is channeling there, where uh, it says that humans are to be crowned with glory and honor, with all things put in subjection under their feet. But to be the royal priesthood in the present age means, just like Jesus, to share in the pain and suffering of the world in order to hold onto it in prayer before God who is listening intently to what the Spirit is saying within us. And then the mystery that we don't know what to pray for. And that's lament. Lament is when you don't say, okay, God, I want you to do this and this and this and this. Lament is when you just say, oh no, this is terrible, I can't bear it. But say it in the presence of God. That okay. is lament. And then Paul says, when you do that, the Spirit is groaning within you with inarticulate groanings. In other words, God knows the mind of the Spirit, but the mind that God knows is the mind that doesn't even know what to say. Even the Spirit is wordless. And when we say, as it's in one of the uh, apocryphal books that says the Spirit of God fills the whole world, we Anglicans sometimes use that as a liturgical refrain at Pentecost. Refrain, Alleluia, the Spirit of God fills the whole world. I once preached a sermon on Pentecost when I said, if the Spirit of God really does fill the whole world, what the Spirit is mostly doing right now is grieving, is lamenting. And we have to learn to be the people who hold on to that lament and allow the spirit to lament within us because it is through that romans 8 28 and i expound this in detail in the book it's really really important it isn't all things work together for good for those who love god it's god works all things together for good through those who love god and accord according to his purposes in other words through those who are prepared to do that lament and to allow the spirit to lament in them and the point is, if it wasn't, if we knew what the result was going to be, it wouldn't be lament. It would just be, okay, thanks God, you're going to do this. When we are lamenting, we are opening ourselves humbly to the fact that we don't know what God wants to do next, but we just offer ourselves to be part of whatever it is. Thank you for that, Tom. Our time is uh, nearly up, and I'd like for you to give us just a little preview. I think there are people on this call we're holding off on preaching Galatians until your commentary finally comes out. Um, can you tell us where that is? I, I think you finished it during this shelter yeah, in place period. I, I did. I, I finished it a week or so after, um, after Easter. And I'm in the process of um, uh, doing the proofs at the moment. They sent me the first batch. And one of the things I would say, I, I, I wrote the commentary before the whole horrible business about George Floyd, etc., and the Black Lives Matter movement got underway. But as I now look at it, I realize that in expounding Galatians 2 and 3 and 4 particularly, and Paul's vision for the unity of the church across ethnic boundary lines, I was already saying in the commentary a great deal of what I have wanted to say and what I said 20 minutes ago to you. And so I do hope that that commentary will be a help to people in the British and American churches and maybe elsewhere too, precisely at this time, because Paul's gospel vision to say it again, is not about how we get to heaven. It's about how God comes to dwell with us and how in the present time, because of Jesus embodying God in our midst and dying for our sins, the Spirit is now dwelling within us to make us the people of God of every kingdom and nation and tribe and tongue. And that is so important in Galatians. It's so important right now that I do hope that book will make its mark in that way. Thank you. Yeah, we look forward to it. Well, Tom, as a fellow uh, granddad, it's important to me that you get to uh, your socially distanced fish and chips with your grandkids on time. Yeah. And so would you mind closing our meeting uh, by blessing this group? This sure. is a hardworking group, and uh, I've, we've, we've turned to you for guidance, so thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me this chance to talk about the little book. And, uh, and I, by the way, I, I assume that 
your uh, listeners, readers, join us in, know the online courses that I'm doing, ngwriteonline.org. If they don't, they can look, up, look it up there, ngwriteonline.org. But sure, let, me, let, me, let me use for you the blessing which I always used when I was Bishop of Durham, when I, at the end of a service or whatever. And this is a blessing which kind of draw, joins together the different things that I would be praying for any congregation, but especially at a time like this. May Almighty God make you faithful to his calling, cheerful in his service, and fruitful for his kingdom. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and through you with all those to whom he sends you, now and always. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Mike, thank you. It's always good to see you and talk to you. Bless you. Ble blessings you. on all of you as we leave now. Have thank a wonderful you very day. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.